Welcome back to part 4 of Password Cracking 101 plus 1. At the end of the last video, we completed our rule attack where we looked at an NTLM hash and used Hashcat to attack this using the top 100 word list supplied on your Kali VMs, but augmenting that with a rule. In this instance, we used one rule to rule them all to mangle the candidates inside top 100 and generate more weird and wonderful guesses, one of which was Bigfoot Sunshine, and that was the clear text password of the hash we supplied. We are now going to move on into brute forcing, which is the next section. Okay, so brute forcing is a term that even I'm guilty of throwing around quite wrongly sometimes. Um, you, t you tend to hear, oh, let's brute, you know, when I'm brute forcing a hash, a lot of the time we're not actually brute forcing it in, in the raw sense, um, but that, that, that aside, brute force does still have uh, limited applicability. Um, only up until a certain point, though. That's usually a point of length, um, but the complexity of the algorithm, so how quickly we can how quickly we can attack an algorithm due to its complexity, will also play a big part in our ability to brute force it here. Generally, this is only feasible for sort of up to and including eight length passwords, but this is dependent on the algorithm and it's also dependent on the resources you have available. There's so many factors involved in password attacks, there's quite often not a, a clear, clear cut sort of answer for these things. Um, but if we take NTLM as a, a common example, because it is a very common example of, of hashes that we frequently crack, uh, up until length eight, that can be that can be exhausted, uh, the key space of that can be exhausted um, in just a few hours. So it's very, very quick. Okay, so when we're talking about brute forcing, how do we apply this to Hashcat? How do we tell Hashcat to say, I want you to brute force, so that's test every possible, every possible character available to us to sort of guarantee the success, although it's never guaranteed, of course. Uh, it might be up until uh, a five character or six character password, but up, up to a point, it becomes computationally infeasible to crack, generally around the, the eight or, or higher depending uh, limit. So, when do we brute force? For hashes with hard limits, for example, um, LM hashing. So, LM, if you joined us in, in the last video, uh, has a fixed seven character password. So we can exhaust uh, the key space of LM very, very quickly. Okay, brute forcing is a good example of what we could do there. Or very fast hashes. So let's say we have um, NTLM hashes or MD5 hashes that we're attacking. We could tell Hashcat, right, brute force every eight character password possible using all the character sets that we're going to look at very shortly uh, and just get that out of the way first. Now if we can test that, assuming just a, a standard ASCII character set is used, we're not talking about foreign character passwords just yet, but we will be later on in the course, um, we can get rid of that so we know the password is going to be nine characters or greater, for example. Okay, so how do we do that in Hashcat? Well, looking at Hashcat help, scrolling to near the bottom, we can see that it has a number of built-in character sets. Now, we're not going to look at all of these, um, but this particular one, A, is uh, a placeholder, and it's a placeholder for the 95 principal ASCII characters, which we'll look at shortly. Okay, so what does LUDS mean with these question marks? Well, if we look just slightly higher up here, we have LUD and S just here, and these are placeholders for Hashcat that represent character sets. L uh, is here for lower alpha, which is our lower alphabet, 26 characters. U for upper alpha, there are our capital letters. D for decimal, and then S is our remaining 33 special characters. And these four character sets comprise the 95 printable ASCII characters. Okay, the H is our for hex, and we're, we're not going to we're not going to look at the other stuff here just yet. But A means a placeholder for L, U, D, and S. So when we apply a mask to Hashcat here, in this case we're telling Hashcat to brute force 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 A's. What we're telling Hashcat is to brute force up to an 8 character password and testing in each of these positions a lower, an upper, a decimal and a special. Okay. Now, if we did not have this dash dash increment switch at the end, Hashcat would only test eight characters. So if you had a seven character password, Hashcat would not get it, because it's only been told to look for eight characters. Dash dash increment tells Hashcat, start at character one and build up after you've tested for all of those characters in each position, so grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is very, very important when brute forcing to make sure you've covered bases so you're not gonna miss out on any shorter passwords than you otherwise would have missed. Okay, 
also now going to introduce Markov modeling. Now, Hashcat's very clever and does this by default. Markov modeling is another thing that will really help us increase our chances of guessing passwords based on the probability and frequency of character placement within passwords. What this does is, and we've given you an example of its, its origin in terms of Markov modeling, but Markov modeling looks at, looks at your previously cracked password, looks at statistics to calculate the probability of password frequency and character placement. So for example, if we see a Q, it's very likely a U might follow. But Hashcat knows this, and I believe its Markov, its own internal Markov models are based off the Rock U dictionary. So it can look at your cracks and it says, of all of your cracks that you've had previously, all of your password cracks, it'll do statistical analysis based on what you've got. And you can tell Hashcat to, you can provide a custom Markov if you want to, and you can tell it to do it differently. But generally, by default, the Markov modeling Hashcat uses is very good. It works very, very well. And it uses known cracks based off Rock U to determine the probability and frequency of your character placement. Now, this can be seen on the command line in a high level example. If we tell Hashcat in brute force mode to just print lower alpha characters, you can see it doesn't start A, B, C, D. It starts with S first, then M because Hashcat's internal Markov tables are telling Hashcat to guess the most likely letters based on what it's seen, based on Rock U. Okay, we could say Markov disable and then you can see, same with numbers, it'll go zero through nine rather than the most popular numbers and things. But we don't need to really ever worry about this because Hashcat's already doing this for us, okay? So even though we might not guess the password, Hashcat is inherently giving us our best possible chance of doing it by employing Markov modeling. So we don't need to worry about this. This is just kind of background knowledge and food for thought. Okay, key space. I've said this so many times now, it's about time I introduced it for anyone who's still scratching their head. Key space is the maximum number of possibilities required to guess any given password, okay? So when we say brute forcing the key space, we mean brute forcing the every possible guess in a way that gives us a 100% chance of successfully cracking a password. Now, for, of course, for long passwords, brute forcing, that's computationally infeasible, and it will take millions and millions, if not billions of years to do. But for lower, uh, for smaller key spaces, maybe up to eight characters, if we've got good enough hardware, this is possible, okay? So how do we determine the key space of a given password? Well, fortunately, the maths isn't too hard. We need to know the available characters we need to test, and we need to raise that to the power of the length of the password. Now, I appreciate an attacker wouldn't know these things, but we're not really looking at this adversarially right now. We're just looking at this in terms of understanding the construction and how the maths works. So if we take the 95 printable ASCII characters, shown on the right here, we have our 26 upper, our 26 lower alpha, our 10 digits, and our remaining 33 symbols, including the all-important space key. Space is awesome. Use it where possible. Uh, Windows supports it. Add spaces to your passwords, okay? When you, when you encounter applications, other things that don't allow you to use spaces and special characters, it's usually down, unfortunately, to sort of slightly poorer coding than anything else. There's no legitimate reason why you shouldn't be allowed to use a space. It's a valid ASCII character. It does not affect the hash block. So, yeah, level up your password resiliency by adding spaces and adopt a passphrase over pass uh, password approach. We'll be touching more on this later. Um, here are printable characters, available characters to the power length. So for a very easy example, if we've got a six character password that's only numbers, there are only 10 digits, zero through nine, raised to the power six, it gives us a million guesses. So it's mathematically impossible for us to guess a million and one times for a six character password because we are going to get the correct password, okay? Now that's not to say it's gonna take you a million guesses. There's every chance you're gonna guess it before then. In fact, there's only a one in a million chance it's gonna take you a million guesses to get it. Markov modeling helps us, of course, reduce this lower as well, um, but we're giving ourselves finite upper limits, okay? So if we know the key space, we can mathematically tell in many instances how long it's going to take for us to, to guess a given password or not. Hashcat, can, of course, can help do this for us as well. And it's something that we can very quickly see. Yeah, OK, that's a reasonable attack. It's going to take three hours, 10 hours, um, however many days, whatever you're willing to give it. So gut feel. This always works better in a live audience, which of course I don't have now because you can ask for a show of hands. But I'm going to take everyone on blind faith. They're not going to be loading up their calculators. Um, which password do you think has the bigger key space? A nine character password that uses every available character. So at least one upper, one lower, one number and one decimal. Or a 10 character password using only mixed alphanumeric. So dropping those 33 symbols. Okay. Um, 
generally people kind of have a mixed view on this but I will put everyone out of their misery and uh, say that 10 characters is actually a better password okay now uh, and that's not to say that 630 quadrillion guesses is any small number Ooh, of course it's uh, of course it's not but 62 to the 10 is greater than 95 to the 9 the math speaks for itself okay so um, length is more important than complexity and that's part of the guidance that NIST republished in 2017 um, about the importance of length over complexity, promoting past phrases over passwords. It's more important that your password is very, very long than worrying about actually really, you know, enforcing complexity and making sure people are adding special characters. OK, so pure brute forcing. What do the numbers look like? And this is based on speed. Now, I mentioned earlier. Uh, in an earlier video, I think it was, in fact, uh, that we can attack hashes at tremendous speed, especially for very fast hashes like MD5 and NTLM. Now, if you are uh, a gamer and you have a gaming rig, or if you are actually, a, you know, you, you do password cracking as part of your job and you have a special password cracking rig, like one shown here on the right, you might have one, or if you're very lucky, many NVIDIA graphics cards, which are fantastic for crunching the numbers and cracking hashes. Now, this benchmark is taken here from uh, Chicken Man's gist. Now, Chicken Man is an, an awesome guy, Sam Crowley, part of the Hashcat uh, team. He's one of the core developers, um, really great guy, and is very, very active on forums and Discord and things, and, and goes a long way to helping Hashcat you know, be what it is today. So these uh, stats were taking off uh, a gist from one of Chicken Man's benchmarks. Now, these shouldn't be taken as gospel values. Benchmarking is like the, the absolute ideal uh, values you get. You don't often get that, and there are many things that, that can affect that. But across an average, it gives us a good idea of the types of sort of ballparks we can we can attack NTLMs at in this case. Now, uh, mega hashes, you've got killer hashes, and you've got giga hashes here. Okay, so a giga hash is a billion hashes per second. A mega hash is a million hashes per second, and a killer hash, a KH, as you'll see in Hashcat, is a thousand hashes per second. So Assuming a 95 character set, a raw brute force, 8 NVIDIA RTX 3090s, this specific hardware, you can be looking at nearly, you can be bordering on the kind of nearly a trillion guesses per second area, which is absolutely phenomenal speeds. It's also why you can see here, uh, 8 character passwords, NTLMs at least, can be exhausted very, very quickly. In two hours when you're talking about hardware like this. Now, I don't I don't have 8 like, 3090s at my disposal, unfortunately, uh, but if I did, you know, it, it would be, it'd be fantastic. Um, so you can see here how 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13 are, of course, they, they become very quickly completely unfeasible. OK, nine character NTLM. Fair enough. Seven and a half days is very, very doable. But I'm personally not going to be sitting around waiting for two years for a 10 character password to crack. And this is why brute forcing in its, in its pure sense has limited applicability, because the curve just sort of goes off the chart very, very quickly. So let's jump into our next exercise, brute force attacks. Jumping back into our Kali VM in the background, we have uh, exercise for MD5 hash. OK, so we know we're looking for an MD5. Let's jump back into here. And if I do a grep for MD5, oh, many, many MD5s. Here we go. We want a raw MD5 hash cat uh, hash mode zero so let's uh, I mean we could of course look at our exercise again and here is our hash um, I am going to as with previous videos just copy and paste this in we are going to crack this using a brute force attack so mode zero is MD5 as we've just identified here is our hash. We need attack mode three. So attack mode three is brute force mode in Hashcat. You can of course go back um, either to check an earlier video or look at the Hashcat help to identify this. And then we have our mask that we've applied here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight A's. And if you think back to our earlier slide here, those A's represented our lower upper, decimal, and special characters. So every question mark A represents a uh, one of basically the 95 printable ASCII characters. So we're looking for an eight character password and we want to increment. We want to tell Hashcat start at one and build up. So Hashcat's gonna do that and it happened very quickly there, but you can see 
Um, here we are, Guess Mask 1. So it's taken the first A, just one character, and exhausted it. It's guessing at around 7,500 guesses a second at this point. Okay, then it builds up to 2, exhausted. Then it builds up to 3, again exhausted. And you can see here how this increment is allowing us to build up further and further. We're now on a, a, a 4 character mask here, again exhausted. Now it's taking a little bit longer, I'm going to press S for a status update, and we can see that it's got about two and a half minutes left to exhaust a five character key space for this MD5. And there we go, look at that. How well timed was that? Status cracked. MD5, it was a five character mask that got it here, and we can see here dollar DF percent one. Five character password there. So this just goes to show, and it also got up to Hashcat had warmed up a bit here, and we got up to 44,000 killer hashes. That's 44 million guesses a second, okay? Now, this is on a, a virtual machine that, of course, I'm running on VirtualBox, but even that, that's phenomenally slow. I mean, that's really slow for an NTLM hash. If you were doing this on host hardware using an NVIDIA graphics card, you would likely get much, much quicker speeds than this. But there is our MD5 password that we've managed to brute force. And there we have it. Okay, so there was our clear text password this time. Thanks very much for joining us. Hope you come back for the next video where we're going to carry on into another attack type. See you soon.